Teach me, teach me. I used to be ready. Uh, depending on who was here tonight, I was going to vary the lesson or the lecture or the, the talk. Um, we were expecting a bunch of Irish girls, young Irish gr girls. So, um, so, so there was I, no reason for my coming? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. Um, that would certainly have made for a very different type of um, discussion because I would be very interested to know how they feel about the topic tonight, which is essentially um, constitutionalism versus physical force. In other words, do you, do you do it the legal way, the parliamentarian way, parliamentary way, or do you start throwing bombs or whatever, killing landlords or, you know. Um, <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about for the next hour and how it has been a source of split in Irish history for 200 years. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's hardly surprising. And it's more a product of the fact that we were a subject nation. We wouldn't have had that problem if we didn't have the problem of being dominated by an outside power. So for all, for all, it doesn't, we don't have that problem in California or in Texas or in the United States anywhere, thank goodness. Um, so what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and trace it literally over 200 years from 1798 or thereabouts right down to the presence, present. And just generally talk about it so that we can think about it, e each of us. And maybe it will help us understand uh, Irish history and th things like the Irish Civil War that lasted, unfortunately, for only nine months, but it was very, very destructive and very divisive. Also, there's a tradition of a split in Irish organizations, which is like just a curse that seems to hang over uh, over Ireland, and I believe that that's, why it, that's where it comes from. Um, <clears throat> Brendan Behan, I think it was, that uh, an Irish playwright who, uh, and wit who uh, first made the um, remark that the first item on the agenda of an Irish organisation is the split. <laughs> Let's get right to it. <laughs> and and that's, that's not altogether true, true but um, it, it, it does... Um, it certainly is. one can understand the reasons why. Um, so the divisive nature of the argument is probably what I'm going to dwell on most tonight. But most Irish kids, and that's why I kind of sorry that they're not here, because they would they would immediately at least remember or recognize um, the United Irishmen. These were the various groups, the various stages, if you like of Irish independence um, and the various organizations that uh, participated over those 200 years. And it is a good place to start in 1798 when a lot of real readjustment and realignments took place ar around at least the Western world. Uh, America just got its uh, republic set up and, you know, it wasn't done on the 4th of July, 17. 76 either, it took a while, uh, and they had to, to uh, fight a war with the British, they, they had to then sit down and figure out a constitution, and um, it took a decade or two, and it really it wasn't until pretty close to the end of the 1700s that um, America was starting to be taken seriously by itself and by the rest of the world. The Brits still thought they could come back and take it back. They still hadn't fully um, accepted uh, Cornwallis' defeat at, um, what do you call it? Georgetown, not Georgetown, Georgetown. what's it? Yorktown, thank you. <coughs> well, here yeah. comes an Irish girl. Yeah? Yeah? Good. We need another Irish girl. But um, the United Irishmen 
were Republicans, pure and simple. They were inspired, of course, by Thomas Paine's writing and uh, by the American success in kicking out the English and the French Revolution. And all of that took place pretty well in the uh, 1790s. So the United Irishmen are the first um, really big, uh, serious threat to uh, the English control over Ireland. Now at that time, the, uh, <coughs> the, the Irish had their own parliament. And in many ways, they were a little, not quite, but they were independent to a, to a, to a degree. Um, and um, <coughs> Dublin, for instance, and Belfast were thriving. They were very um, uh, wealthy economically. And in, in some respects, it was because they were so successful that they were thinking of seceding, breaking away. Um, so immediately there was that discussion. Well, yeah, we need to become more like America, but we really don't want to go like the French and uh, behead the king and, and, and you know, go the whole hog. So there was, there was quite a, um, a division of opinion there as to whether or not there should become a full-blown republic uh, abolish the monarchy like the um, Americans and the French did, or whether they should strengthen their um, uh, autonomy, their separation from, from England, and become what eventually countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so on became. And interestingly enough, it was the fear of that happening that the Irish had a good case for being independent. Now, when I say the Irish, uh, uh, there was very much the haves and the have-nots. The, the, um, the merchant class were very wealthy and doing extremely well um, and had, th had prospered by the actual war with the French in that they were a very important part of the British economy, and they were selling to, to, to the British. But it was precisely because, well, not precisely, but largely because um, the British didn't want to see Ireland becoming more uh, independent, albeit loyal to the English crown, that many believe, including myself, that the English deliberately um, fostered, precipitated, um, encouraged rebellion. They encouraged the the um, the element which wanted physical force <coughs> and total separation and a republic, so that they could go in with overwhelming force and put it out once and for all. And there's a lot of evidence to that. Um, and I dwelt on that for a little while because that became that was so successful that the English learned a great deal from it and they they practiced it right down to the present day that when there is a danger of secession and part of your uh, family treasures like you know they they were very possessive about Ireland and it wasn't just because they were afraid that it would have been become a, a platform for some European power like the French because the Irish never really wanted that some of them did but generally speaking they didn't and um, they just wanted it you know, there was uh, nobody's ever really figured out why but certainly um what they learned at that time they practiced throughout the 19th century and throughout the 20th century, and still practice to this day. They did it very successfully in the most recent peace process, so-called. Um, yeah, it is, we have peace, but we haven't got a solution. <laughs> we still have a divided country. And we still have a small country with two different currencies, for God's sake. You know, uh, we have the euro in the south, and our so-called south, and the British pound in the north. And a lot of different laws in fact, two entirely different systems. 
a, a system based on monarchy and the, supr the supremacy of parliament, and a, a system based on a constitution, uh, and a, a, namely a republic, like what we're used to here in America. So uh, they're real. Uh, you don't notice it when you drive. Uh, there is no longer a border, but there is a jurisdiction. So that if you uh, live and work in north of the border, you're under a different set of laws than south of the border. Kind of like here in America, you have a different set of laws in Nevada than you do in California. And there are certain things that it has a big impact on, like corporations and whatever. So they're, 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 they're very, very different jurisdictions, not just similar jurisdictions like you do here in the United States, or even between us and Canada, but, but fundamentally different. Uh, the, the very fundamental difference that was uh, the subject of the, the 1798 rebellion and the, 